Good evening. Welcome to this first ever webinar series by the Newton Conservators. As most of you probably know, Newton Conservators is a nonprofit established in 1961 and works to preserve and to maintain open space in Newton. For more information about the organization, check out our website at newtonconservators.org. We'd love to have you become a member while you're there. New members get a Newton Trail Guide as a welcome gift. My name is Beth Wilkinson, and I'll be the moderator of this virtual event. With that business out of the way, let's turn to the important part of the evening. Listening to Barbara Bates transport us to a fresh pot water pond at the height of summer. For the past 16 years, Barbara's been a teacher for Mass Audubon's Habitat Education Center and Wildlife Sanctuary in Belmont. Before the pandemic, she led guided nature walks for all ages on a variety of subjects and presented programs at several retirement communities and senior centers. Barbara has retired several times, first from a long career in the high tech world and more recently from teaching negotiating, negotiation and conflict resolution at Northeastern University. Barbara loves all things nature. Fortunately, she's here to share her love of nature with us tonight. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Beth. So what we're going to cover today is what's going on in a freshwater pond. And we have a lot of those ponds here in Newton. We have, as you can see, Dolan Pond uh, right here. I want to get that with red. So we've got Dolan Pond here. We have... It has actually Quinn Pond in the same area and Banana Pond in the same area. And this is up on off of Webster, Webster uh, Park. Road. And then with our purchase of Webster Woods, we got Bear Pond, which is a vernal pool. We've always had Hammond Pond, which is a beautiful, beautiful place uh, to walk around. And in addition, just above Hammond Pond, we have Houghton's Pond, which is currently being hydro raked. Now, if you go, uh, go across from uh, City Hall, you'll see Bur uh, Bulla's Pond. And Bulla's Pond is a nice little walk all the way around it. It's a great walk for early, early spring because right in this area up here, you will see the most beautiful display of witch hazel, uh, vernal uh, witch hazel in orange and yellow as well. Now, just over the Newton border in Needham, we have Kendrick Pond and some beautiful marshy areas all along the, the, uh, the river. So what is a pond and how does it form? A pond is simply a shallow lake that's small. Uh, ponds are usually no more than five or six feet deep. Uh, they're much smaller than lakes. It's a subjective thing. Uh, they call it uh, Kendrick. If we go back here, you'll see that they call it Kendrick Pond. As far as I'm concerned, it looks like a lake, but it's all in the eyes of the beholder. So the pond forms by having some kind of a depression in the soil where water accumulates. Now, sometimes there's an inlet and that keeps the pond full of water. Sometimes there is no inlet or outlet and you have a vernal pond that disappears and dries up in the summer. But these ponds can form anywhere. The problem is they're temporary as long as they have no inlet. They're temporary because as uh, vegetation comes into the pond, it decomposes and begins to become silt and, and the pond starts to fill up. And the reason that the vegetation is filling it up is that ponds are shallow. So at you know five to six feet, water plants can grow in it. They can get enough sunlight to actually grow in the pond. Now, ponds have a life all year round. Winter, summer, spring, fall, doesn't matter. They've, they've got life going on in them. And if you want to see some beautiful, beautiful pictures, uh, go to our website. Anne Kane has a whole year in the life of Webster Woods in Hammond Pond. I also want to say something about winter. Winter is not a dead time for ponds. You will see here raccoon tracks around a pond in the Newton Cemetery where a raccoon hunts for crayfish at an outflow. And here 
you'll on the other side on the on the left hand side you'll see white-tailed deer tracks across the second pond in the newton cemetery so there's a lot going on even in winter but let's get back to the major time you're going to see a pond which is probably spring summer and and fall and this beautiful graphic of the web of life on a pond actually compresses all of those seasons into one it shows you salamander larva frog and toad larva the fish that are in there the diving beetles the water striders and the di and the and the little whirligig beetles the wood frogs the toads the dragonflies the snakes everything that these are toad larvae here uh, everything that you can imagine is going on in there it also shows you some of the vegetation that grows around the pond and the vegetation is important to a pond so the first thing we're going to talk about are those amazing cattails and they are amazing we're talking things that are six feet tall as you can see on the left and they're only an inch wide and six feet tall i defy you to get a piece of paper or anything for that matter that's only an inch wide and six feet long to stand up straight as these cattails do the reason they're able to do that is their unique cell structure and that cell structure does a couple of really fascinating things one it holds it architects that leaf so that it holds it up straight and second it has a spongy material in it that acts like a straw so that the rhizomes at the base where it's wet down here at the bottom the rhizomes under the water can get air even if these stems are dead through those straw-like capillaries cattails are also interesting in the way that they spread they have a male and female flower on the same stem the male if you look at the far left the male is atop and the female flower is below it looks like a green cigar and as it as it ripens it looks like a brown cigar the male flowers at the top shower pollen down on the female flowers and that allows them to ripen and you can see the the little tiny flowers here on the female head now below the ground below the water is this root system and you can see how it's giving rise to another cattail right here that means that you can have whole spreads of cattails through that uh, th through this rhizome uh, arrangement that actually leads to uh, clonal formation so that you can have acres of cattail and have only two or three actually distinctly genetically different plants because they're doing that rhizome spreading but they can spread by seeds too and we're talking uh, right now is a good time actually to go out in Cutler Woods and see uh, the marshlands with these uh, cattail heads starting to go to seed what you'll see are acres and acres of these things but each one of those cattail heads can produce between 20,000 and 700,000 seeds to be dispersed by wind so it's a pretty amazing plant Now the other plants that you'll find in ponds are duckweed and duckweeds are these little tiny single cell plant like this with a nice little root you see this frog uh, and this is a bullfrog here uh, immersed in that uh, duckweed doesn't eat it he's just hiding there camouflaging you'll also see at the edge of the pond in the shallower water pickerel weed and it's got those beautiful purple blue flowers and can be quite fragrant and then as long as the water isn't more than say four max five feet deep you'll see water lilies water lilies have to anchor to the bottom and if it gets too deep they won't be able to grow now they call it duckweed for a reason and that's because ducks eat it let me get rid of this pen and we'll start this video this is a wonderful video by ted uh, Kuklinski, the president of Newton Conservators, he took it at Dolan Pond, and you can see these baby ducks just slurping up the surface pondweed because it grows on the surface. You'll see mom start to get in on the action now, and she'll go hoovering up just like a vacuum cleaner. 
And when you come to a pond that uh, has a lot of this duckweed, you'll see actual trails, as you're beginning to see now, uh, where the ducks have swum. Now, in addition to the pond plants, you'll see insects, very common insects. And about this time of year, you'll see these dragonflies. And dragonflies are some of my favorites. The white tails, the, the female down in the lower right, and the male up in the, uh, the upper right are very common and they're easy to spot on a pond because they like to actually land and stay stationary long enough for you to get a picture of them. Uh, but so do club tails and you've got a unicorn club tail uh, also photographed at the uh, Newton cemeteries right here on the ponds of the Newton cemeteries right here in the lower left. Now those dragonflies come from dragonfly nymphs. So the, the animal lives its uh, baby life in the water as a nymph, a larva, and you can see it's complete here. You can see its head, it's got these little tiny wings, it's got jets at the bottom, it actually moves by jet propulsion, shooting water out of its rear end, and it has jaws here that shoot out like, uh, like a pitchfork almost, and that pitchfork spears things like uh, toad and uh, salamander larva, little tiny tadpoles, small fish, uh, and it will eat them. So it's a predator as a, as a nymph, and it's a predator as an adult. As an adult, it'll be flying over the surface of the pond like an attack helicopter capturing insects. The other insects that you're gonna find in or at the surface of the pond, I'm gonna start at the bottom here, are the predaceous diving beetles. Now, this slide is somewhat deceptive because the adult predaceous diving beetle, the one that you see in the lower right, only gets to about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. But the larva of the predaceous diving beetle that you see on the left can get to three inches long. And both of these are prodigious, prodigious predators. They will bite and eat anything, small invertebrates, uh, the water striders that you see above, anything that they can catch. But the larva particularly, that three inch larva, is called a toe biter for a reason. It will bite your toes as you dangle them in the water. The insect above is called a water strider, sometimes called a Jesus bug because of the way it walks on water. But what you will see here is an animal that is easiest to see by the shadow it casts. Uh, at least for my old eyes. And that shadow right here is the shadow of the legs, the dimples of the legs on the water. And you can see the adult here with the mirror surface, the back legs, the, scent, the middle legs that are used for propulsion, the back legs mostly for stability, and the front legs uh, for for capturing prey because both of these animals are, are predators. Now, what makes that water strider's legs able to, to stand on the top of the water is all these tiny microscopic hairs. This animal is just completely hairy. And th those little hairs capture oxygen or, or air and make the animal float. But it's an interesting proposition because these animals mate at the top of the water. And the male, of course, will be on top of the female and they make a lot of ruckus when they do this. And so fish will come up and eat them if they're not careful. So a female doesn't often repel a male. She gets it over with fast so that she doesn't get eaten. Also at the surface, you'll see aquatic wolf spiders. And these spiders have hairy bodies. They can actually dive. And they have a way of capturing prey with these front legs, impaling them on their chalicera, their fangs and then letting go with their front legs. And that allows them to continue to move around while the prey is being injected with venom that paralyzes it and then liquefies it so the spider can suck it up and eat it. Now, if you start to disturb this spider, it's gonna dive. It can actually dive underwater and live on the air for a minute or two at least uh, that's trapped in the, uh, the hairy body that it has. Also under the water in that pond are crustaceans, the famous crayfish. 
And these crayfish can get quite large. You can see the size of them here. They're detrivores. They're going to eat anything that's decaying, decaying leaves and, and plant matter, decaying animal matter. Uh, all of that sort of thing is going to be what they're feeding on. They look like little tiny lobsters. And in fact, raccoons think of them as little tiny lobsters. And you'll often find raccoon prints. These are little raccoon prints here and all the way up through here. They're looking in this water for the kinds of crayfish that they would find. And when you see a raccoon, you know what people say that they're, they're washing their hands? They're not washing their hands. They're feeling in the mud and the dirt for these crustaceans that they like to eat, especially these, uh, these little crayfish. So let's look at some of the other things you're going to see in the pond. And we'll try to do this through sort of a, a typical day. In the morning, we'll start with the early morning where we get the frogs and the ducks out there eating. Uh, we'll go to the peak basking time for turtles and snakes that really runs around the noon hour. And then the best time for watching swans and herons and beaver, late afternoon for the swans and the herons or early in the morning, but late afternoon for sure for uh, the swans and the herons. And then for the beaver and the muskrat, I would say evening, because these are primarily nocturnal animals. Spring peepers are the, some of the first frogs you hear in the spring. You can tell a spring peeper they're tiny. This, uh, this little one here is on a dime, but the baby peeper, the newly emerged peeper, is about the size of the end of your little finger fingernail. And the adult doesn't get much larger than the end of your thumb but they're all distinctive in having this X across their back. You can see it even light on the little one here. And they have a very distinctive sound. That's the individual. And it's this chorus that you hear in the spring. That chorus can be up to 4,500 calls in a night from a single frog. And it's a way of attracting mates. You'll also see bullfrogs. And this is the one that sounds like the frog foghorn. <coughs> You'll hear that foggy foghorn, especially in June when they start to mate and wrestle with each other and, and fight for territory. Now, the bullfrog has a release call that's a little bit, uh, or a frightened call, that's a little bit different than a green frog, and it makes sort of a grunting sound, but we'll play that in a second here. Bullfrogs are ginormous, and they're invasive. They started off in the southern um, United States and they've worked their way north. They are not native to Massachusetts. They're an invasive species, if you will. Uh, they get up to six inches long. They're huge and they will, they're prodigious eaters and they will eat literally anything they can get their mouth around. You can see the size of the tadpole. Uh, the tadpole is maybe an inch in diameter and will take up to three years in the northern climates to actually get to the size where it can turn into a frog. And that's because of the cold water that we have here. So those bullfrog tadpoles will be in a pond overwintering for as many as two winters, unless it's a very, very warm pond. Now the distinction between bullfrogs and green frogs, green frogs are native and they do get large, not quite as large as bullfrogs, is the, you can't really do it by color because the colors vary on both of them, but it's by this thing called a dorsolateral ridge. And you can see by the yellow pen, uh, the yellow pointer, this ridge that runs all the way from the eye almost to the back end of the frog, um, the green frog. On the bullfrog, there's no ridge, but there is a little tiny ridge right around his ear but there's nothing down his back. So there's no dorsolateral fold at all. And he's spotted usually 
and he's usually creamy color on the bottom and usually a green head. Your green frog will always have a green upper lip, but that's about only thing you've got. Now you can tell a male green frog from a female green frog because if this eardrum, this, this is the eardrum right here behind the eye, is uh, larger than the eye, let me get rid of that for a second here. Uh, I'll just go back and get rid of that for us. Uh, I'm going to have to erase it. Sorry, folks. Okay, you can see the, the eardrum here uh, is larger than the eye. So this is the, uh, the male of the frog. Now, we're going to play a green frog for us. And it doesn't have that aww, that sort of foghorn sound that you have on a green on a on a bullfrog, but it also has a different yelping sound when it's startled. Here's I think I can get the yelp here. Yeah, did you hear that little squeak? That squeak is the startled frog. The, the, the bullfrog, let's get the bullfrog, you'll hear a grunt. That's the grunt that it makes. Now, as I said, bullfrogs are invasive and the Rocky Mountains is one of the few places that don't have bullfrogs. And Canada is trying to get, in Canada, California is trying to get rid of them because as they are, as I said before, they will eat so much that they will outcompete all the other local frogs, driving away what we used to have in terms of leopard frogs and pickerel frogs and all sorts of other frogs, because they're just eating everything that the other frogs would eat. Uh, to give you a sense of what they can do and what they can eat, uh, let me tell you a story about a snapping turtle uh, nest release that we did for a for a uh, high school in Waltham and the headmaster had found a hatched nest of snappers and these little snappers are about maybe two inch diameter and we released these little snappers on the school pond they go running down to the lake and bam 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 just like that this bullfrog that was sitting there swallowed three of those little turtles in a row and he would have eaten a fourth and a fifth if we hadn't frightened him away at the edge of the pond, not in it unless they're breeding, at the edge of the pond, you're also going to find the American toad. And the American toad is a frog. All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. It's one of those category things like squares and rectangles. Uh, frogs are primarily living on the land. They're not aquatic until they come to breed. But they're also somewhat warty looking. And they have despite that warty exterior, the most incredible call you've ever heard. That high-pitched trill is an American toad. Who knew? <laughs> I always thought it was birds when I was first walking in the woods. Toads will lay eggs in ponds, and they're these beautiful spirals of, uh, of sort of like cellophane and individual embryos all the way down the spiral. Those hatch in anywhere from three days to 10 days to provide toad tadpoles like this in ponds and puddles. And within less than two months, they will become toads. Now, also on the pond, you're going to find ducks. And I want you to look closely at this mallard because he's gorgeous. But he will breed with literally any other duck that he can get close to. And mallard, male mallards have been known to interbreed so extensively with black ducks that it's almost impossible now to find a non-hybridized black duck. But mallards are also, while they're primarily plant eaters, they will also take protein. 
And those toad tadpoles I showed you, I remember walking in Dolan Pond and coming to a little pond, a little pool, maybe it, was a, it wasn't even a pool, it was a puddle. It maybe was three feet wide puddle. And this mallard, male mallard, is slurping through, just shoveling through that pond. And I'm thinking, what is he eating? I don't see any weeds, I don't see anything. It's really early spring, there's no emergent greenery. He's slurping up toad tadpoles. Just slurping them up. And another example of this is when a pond, a turtle pond at Habitat Sanctuary in Belmont, totally dried up to a, to a puddle about three feet wide, and all the frogs had converged into that puddle. And along came a male mallard like this and started swallowing live adult frogs, choking them down. Who knew? The female doesn't look at all like the male. She needs to camouflage. And you'll find her on most of the ponds too. These are dabbling ducks, so they will uh, be at the surface and picking up greenery and shoveling in duckweed, as you saw. But this female mallard will lay a nest close to the pond, usually. She doesn't really make a nest. She just lays her eggs and then she tries to drag uh, vegetation. As you can see here, she's, this is her eye, right? On the left side, you'll see the eye with a stripe through it. She's dragged this fern, trying to cover herself with the fern. Uh, she'll pull, and you can see the little pieces of down here, she'll pull uh, down from her uh, breast and lay it over the eggs when she's not on the nest. But she will nest there, she'll have a clutch of anywhere up to 10, maybe 14 eggs, usually once a year, and takes maybe about a month to incubate them until they hatch. But the interesting thing is the sites that they choose. I found that they're not particularly choosy about where they lay their eggs. This is Millennium Park, for goodness sake. At the, at the right, where you cannot see it, are the public toilets. <laughs> I'm six feet from where the end of the green grass ends, and you can see the three arrows showing you three mallard eggs. The reason I saw those eggs is that the mallard was on the nest there, laying them, when a dog walked by, those two people had the dog, the dog walked by and went bananas. And I was trying to figure out why the dog was bananas and the, the duck flew off and then I saw the eggs. So mallards don't seem to be very picky about where they lay their eggs. Now, once the sun comes out and starts to get really strong, that's when all the herps come along. You know, we're talking about the, the turtles and the snakes and uh, the herpetology animals. They're all cold-blooded, they need to warm up, and the sun does that for them. So they'll haul their bodies out of the water and find dry land, a log, stones, anything they can find, top of the cattail rushes, and they'll sit there trying to soak up the sun. Prime sun, prime sun soaking time starts at 11, probably ends at two or three. They'll be out earlier on a really warm summer morning, you'll find them out at eight, and they'll, you'll find them still around at three or four. But they're doing that because basking and maximum skin exposure raises their temperature. You can see how these turtles have their necks extended, their legs extended, everything that they can possibly extend. They're balancing on the bottom of their carapace, the bottom shell, and just, you know, spread eagle trying to soak up the rays. They've got a dark shell, which will also uh, raise their temperature. Also basking is the northern water snake. And the northern water snake is a very large snake. It's, uh, it's not a poisonous snake. Uh, it eats invertebrates, fish, uh, other small tadpoles and frogs, things like that, that it catches in the water. And it takes small rodents at the edge of the water but it's an animal that will bask at the side of the pond. So you'll find it maybe half submerged in the water as, as the lower right shot shows. This is a picture taken in Lake Winnipesaukee or totally out of the water, just sunning itself and getting warm. They can get up to nearly six feet long and they're very thick bodied, but they are very, very variable in color. In the, in the top slide, you can see the, what look like stripes but in the bottom, they're, they're virtually invisible. 
once they get wet, they look like they're almost black. Now, I want, to, <laughs> I want to warn you about picking these snakes up. They will bite you. They're not poisonous. They will bite you. But worse than their bite is the incredible stink that they will let loose on you. And it, it's, a, it's a musky spray, and it is really <laughs> disgusting. If you've ever picked up a large garter snake, they're, they're also pretty stinky. Uh, but this is a very useful snake. It's a very, very good swimmer, uh, both submerged and at the surface when it's going after its frogs, tadpoles, and, uh, and crayfish. When it, uh, the, the, the part of this slide that says the, the body scales are strongly keeled, if you look closely at these little diamonds, those are the keels, those are the scales. And a keel is a little ridge down the center of each scale. And these, these ridges actually stand up. Now, the champion of all baskers, of course, is the painted turtle. And this is the painted turtle seen from the side and below. The plastron is the bottom part of the shell, and the edges of the shell is the marginal part of the shell connected to the top part of the shell, which is the carapace. A painted turtle has a creamy bottom shell and an olive drab, black, grayish top shell or carapace. It's also, if it's the eastern painted turtle, it's the only turtle that has the scutes, which are these plates on its shell, in a totally straight line. A straight line here and a straight line there. It has no red markings on the head, just yellow stripes, but it has red markings on the neck and on the legs. And you can tell the sex of a painted turtle by whether or not its front claws are longer in the middle than on the edges. If the middle claws are two, to two or three times longer than the side claws, it's a male painted turtle. You can tell the difference between a red-eared slider because the red-eared slider has the red ear right behind its eye, as it shows on the right, and the painted turtle has nothing. It has red on the neck, but not anywhere near the eye and the head. And again, you can see that the, paint, the red-eared sliders, the scoots, are not in a line, and in the, uh, in the painted turtle, they are in straight lines across. Now, these red-eared sliders are non-native and they're invasive turtles. These are the pet, pet store turtles that you would get from the dime store, or used to be able to get from the dime store. They're, they're banned now. They're illegal to sell. Uh, and while they can live up here and get quite large, uh, 10 or 12 inches in, in diameter, while they can get quite large, they can't breed because it's, it's the, it, it doesn't have a long enough incubation period for their eggs. So these are our painted turtles basking, and I, and I do mean they're champion baskers. They'll crawl on top of each other. They have been known to bask on the back of loons and even on the back of snapping turtles. They'll bask anywhere they can climb in up out of the water. Painted turtles do nest here, and they nest quite successfully. Uh, they will dig a nest that's sort of flask-shaped, and I'll show you a video of a, of a not a painted turtle, but a, uh, a painted turtle, not an Eastern painted turtle. This is a uh, Midland painted turtle. You can see that the scoots aren't straight across. They're a little bit jagged. This, uh, more, uh, this Midland painted turtle is digging a nest and you can see how she digs it entirely with her back feet. She gets a fistful of mud, deposits it, goes down with the other leg, gets a fistful of mud, deposits it. And the reason she's digging with each leg is that that nest is narrow at the opening and wider as it goes down deeper. What you see as wetness here is where she has urinated to make the soil easier to work and easier to dig. And she'll dig away for half an hour, an hour, until she's quite satisfied, but she's digging blind. It's all back legs. Once she's satisfied with that, she will go on to laying her eggs and literally packing them into the edges. And the whole process will take less than two hours. 
So you can see the eggs already in the nest. Here comes an egg. Now watch her tuck it in. She'll tuck it back into the side. Just to rest and catch your breath here for a second. Tuck it back into the side. And then she'll use her other leg to make sure that the other, the other eggs are tucked in there. You're asking yourself, where does she store those eggs? It's in her body. She can't get a baby bump the way a, a mammal would. But she does have a shell that is thicker from top to bottom than a male turtle. And that allows the eggs to develop in the body because the shell does not expand, of course. And she can't sort of ooze out of the shell the way a, a mammal would, skin would stretch. So she'll tuck that in there and then she'll deposit one last egg. And when she's done laying eggs, there's the last egg. And when she's done laying eggs, she will pack the earth back in. She's packed all the earth in here. And when she's done, as you can see on the right, you would never know that a turtle had finished a nest there. But there is a sad price to pay. There's huge mortality on the nests, uh, up to 90% of the nests are dug up and eaten by predators. Now the other turtle that we have in our Newton ponds is the snapping turtle. And this is a pretty large turtle. It's in fact, it's huge. They look even bigger than they, they are because they're so prehistoric looking. You see this on the bottom picture, you'll see the, these uh, like stegosaurus like uh, bones sticking out of its tail uh, and its shell, the carapace on top, is, is very heavily keeled up here. This is a young snapper. But if you turn the turtle over and you look at the bottom of the turtle, it has a very small plastron. And the reason for that is that this is a bottom walker. It, the, the turtle virtually, once it gets to about four to eight inches, it has no natural predators. Nothing can touch it. And, and as long as it's staying on the bottom, nothing it can get it from the bottom, so it doesn't need to pull its legs into the shell but things could get it from the top. It has a very, very long tail, and this thick neck that you see here allows it to gulp huge amounts of prey when it decides to do that. They are omnivores. They eat decaying stuff on the bottom, they eat plants, they eat frogs, they eat anything they can get their mouth around. And they really do look prehistoric. You can see the plates on the tail much larger here. Uh, these are the animals that really did walk around the earth when the dinosaurs walked around the earth. And the interesting thing about that is that if you were to ask these turtles, or you were to interview them these days, they would say they preferred the dinosaurs to the humans because the humans run them over as they cross roads to do their nesting. Now, as I told you before, these are bottom walkers. And here you have a turtle on the left at Cold Spring Park, who's uh, just sort of walking along the stream that uh, has the little bridge over it as you enter Cold Springs Exercise Trail. And at the top, you have a turtle boogieing along the first pond in the Newton cemeteries. And you can see the, the dust, uh, the dirt, the silt that it's churning up as it's walking along. Uh, this turtle made a U-turn, right angle turn, boom, and went off after a frog right shortly after I took this picture. They walk well on land, too. <laughs> Snappers have distinctive eyes. They see equally well underwater and above water, but the eyes are right at the top of the head, so they can have their nose exposed and th just this part of their head, this little tip of their head exposed, and be breathing and looking around and waiting for things to come along to snap up. And they will take baby ducks, they will take uh, baby goslings, you know, any chick that's at the surface that's small enough to get in their mouth, they will gobble up. So they have very good sight. They also have very good hearing. You can't see the ears, they're here, they're, they're covered by the skin, uh, but they supposedly have very good hearing. And I have to 
agree with that because that turtle I showed you earlier, I heard a frog and that turtle did a right angle turn and took off after that frog. I want to show you the size of the plastron uh, with, I've got it here, the tail is laid against the plastron so you can see how long the tail is and how long the neck is on this animal. But the interesting thing is how small the bottom shell is compared to the top shell. The ribs are actually fused to the shell. This is a shell that, uh, of about a 20 inch turtle that my sister cleaned for me. It was a tur turtle that had been hit by a car and it was decaying in the middle of a pond. And she rescued the decaying body for me so that we could clean it up and use it as a specimen. Because those ribs are fused to the shell, the animal can't breathe the way mammals breathe. We breathe with our ribs. Our ribs are floating and we have muscles between them and we expand our ribs and that takes in air, right? Well, these animals can't expand their ribs, so they have a different way of breathing. They have muscles, abdominal muscles here that you can see in pink and uh, darker pink that pull on the lungs in blue to ventilate this animal. And that's how they actually breathe Now to show you the beak of a snapping turtle, it's made of the same material as your thumbnails and fingernails, keratin. And you can see the beak here. And that beak, if you take it off, it falls right off the bone. That beak is the sharp edge that, oops, hold on, <laughs> getting too far ahead of myself here. That beak is the sharp edge that allows it to cut through things and the jaws have very strong muscles back here that allow it to bite through tin cans. It's got a really vicious bite. You do not want to get your fingers anywhere near a snapping turtle's head. Their claws, these claws are about an inch and a half long, are also coated in keratin. So you have the bone of the claw and the sheath of the keratin. And those spikes on the tail, actual bones, just like a stegosaurus. Now snappers have to be much older before they reach maturity and have enough body mass to actually lay eggs uh, to reproduce. So the average age of a snapper in the north is going to be 19 years old before it starts laying eggs. And they will lay, uh, a painted turtle might lay 10 eggs to a nest, a snapper will lay up to 20 to 24 or even more uh, in a nest. They both nest at about the same time in the spring, uh, late, late spring, early summer, and both of them hatch in the, in the August, late August, early September time frame. Uh, some painted turtle nests will actually overwinter and hatch in the spring because they can freeze and not be damaged. However, a snapper, that, the nest that doesn't uh, hatch in the fall and tries to overwinter or tries to overwinter as babies, will freeze and die. Now I said there was a high predation rate on turtle nests. This is a turtle nest that was dug up uh, by the first pond in the Newton Cemetery and you can see the eggs. These were snapper. They're, they're large eggs. They're a, a, uh, a painted turtle egg would be a little less than an inch, and a snapper is more than an inch. Uh, but you can see how raccoons, skunks, foxes, uh, all of them dig up these nests and then eat the eggs. It's a very, very delicious and nutritious meal. This is another snapper nest. It's about 100 yards from a pond. Uh, this is in the North Quabbin area, the Reservoir Road area. The turtle had dragged up to a nice sandy road, very convenient, right? Dug a nest and the nest had been predated uh, almost as soon as the nest had been uh, secured. And you can see there were so many eggs that the animal didn't finish eating them. Here's a nest that I think was successful. This is this year's nest. I just took these pictures in September. The nest was dug, uh, I'm told, uh, in early summer, uh, late spring. So here you see in the upper 
left, you see the hole. Uh, it doesn't look like it's been dug up by a predator. And in fact, most of the eggshells are still in the nest itself. You can see what the egg fragment looks like. Uh, this hole was about seven inches deep and about three and a half inches wide. Those baby snappers that come at them are so cute, they aren't funny. They will bite you though, so you handle them carefully. And uh, these are the, this is the size snapper that was three of which were eaten in a row by a single bullfrog. So what's in a name? We have the name turtle, tortoise, and terrapin. And the US, the Brits, and the Australians use these words completely differently. The Aussies down at the bottom use only tortoise to describe everything, whether it lives in the water or whether it lives on the land. The Brits distinguish between aquatic turtles that are saltwater, which they call turtles, and aquatic, waters, uh, aquatic turtles that are freshwater, which they call terrapins. And here in the US, we call anything that gets in the water a turtle and anything that gets on the land a tortoise. So let's move on to the late afternoon and the birds. We have herons, great blue herons, that are just gorgeous birds. You can see this one stalking along the edge of a pond uh, in the Newton Cemetery, and this one hanging out, the, the one in the upper left, just hanging out and watching, getting himself really set up nicely. Uh, this is one of the largest herons we have. It stands almost four feet uh, tall when it's out on land, and when it spreads its wings, you're talking a six-foot wingspan, and that bill is almost a foot long. It's, it's a vicious beak. You don't want that beak poking you in the eye. But if you look at all these beautiful feathers hanging off of this bird, in the early 1900s, they would shoot over a hundred and almost 130 herons, egrets, uh, a year to supply ladies' hats in London. And that supply only lasted nine months. But herons are wading birds. Uh, you can see how tall they are here. They nest in rookeries in old ponds that have killed uh, the trees in the ponds. We think they favor this because raccoons aren't going to swim out there and climb up to, uh, to uh, predate uh, their nests. They nest, uh, this is in Groton, it's a mass Audubon sanctuary there, I think it's called Rocky Ledges, and uh, the last time I visited that sanctuary in June, these young were still on the nest. They were waiting, they're like teenagers that won't get out of the house, it's feed me, feed me, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to work on my own. Uh, but herons are wading birds. They will take fish, frogs, uh, and other aquatic animals. This is a heron walking around a pond in Brighton, Chandler Pond, uh, and he's, you're going to see him catch a catfish. This heron was not even six feet from the sidewalk. This is a pond that's very built up. Uh, there are houses all around, a lot of foot traffic all around. You can see the reflections of the houses. And the only nod to uh, humanity that this heron did was to hide behind some bushes as he ate the fish. And he gulped that down. They have a, they have a way of gulping their prey. Their, that, that thin neck can expand quite a lot. Now this heron, same pond, probably the same heron, is after a vole at the edge of the pond. You see him grab it. Bam, and you can hear it chittering. That is not a happy hole. The, the heron is dipping it, saying, okay, it's furry, it'll go down easier if it's wet, right? And of course, it does go down easier if it's wet. <laughs> Also on ponds, you're going to see geese and ducks and swans, but the Canada geese are, at my, to my way of thinking, too many, <laughs> but uh, they're lovely animals to watch. They're feeding, as you can see, 
in the, the lower central part. This is an adult with her head in the water. She's got her head totally underwater as her gosling is learning how to do, feeding on plants that she can reach with that long neck. Swans feed the same way. These are the invasive mute swans. You'll see the orange beak. Uh, this is on Kendrick Pond. And these invasive mute swans were brought over in the 1800s to look beautiful and, and English on families' estates. And they, of course, escaped and started breeding. And now they're all over the Northeast uh, and the Midwest, the upper Midwest as well. They are not native, as I said before. The native swans that we have in North America are the tundra swans and the trumpeter swans. And they, you'll never see them. <laughs> well, maybe never. You'll see them in, in Massachusetts. The tundra swans, you are, are way up on the tundra and, and in Canada. And the trumpeter is in the Rocky Mountains. You might see the tundra swans uh, on a migration down in the Atlantic flyway down through the Chesapeake Bay. But the tundra swans are smaller than the trumpeter swans. And the tundra swans have these yellow patches, little yellow dots on their black bills. Both our native swans have black bills compared to the orange bill on the mute swan. And the trumpeter swan is the larger of the largest of all three of the swans. Uh, and it's, it's, <laughs> Again, we're talking six, seven foot wingspan. This is a very large bird. Swans like geese feed by sticking their neck down and grabbing aquatic growth with their bills, with their beaks. And their beaks are specialized for this. You can see the Canada goose in the upper left and the swan in the lower right. They have tongues with serrations that look like saws on the edge. Both the goose and the, the swan have that serrated tongue. And they have serrations along the edge of their bill. They're not teeth, but they're serrations. And that helps them screen uh, grain off of things and helps them cut aquatic uh, growth that they're feeding on. So, Let's get to evening and beaver watching. This is the best time to watch beaver. And it's the best time because beaver are aquatic uh, at night. They're, uh, they're nocturnal. And so you're most likely to see them at night. If you're lucky enough to see them in the late afternoon in the winter, when it's almost dark, this is what you'll see. They'll be sitting on their tail because it's, it gives them a nice warm place to sit. And they'll be grooming their fur. This is the Beaver Lodge at Kendrick Pond in Cutler Woods. And as you can see, it's surrounded by water. It has an underwater entrance as long as the water is high enough. And inside, it will be housed in total darkness, uh, the parents and their sets of kits, the first and second year sets of kits. Beavers create ponds. They're the only animal beside man in the northern uh, part of the U.S. that can create ponds. Alligators in Florida can create ponds, but beavers are the only ones that can create ponds. And here you can see how they've taken a stone wall and added onto that stone wall to create a flooded pond. They're quite the eco-engineer. Uh, they are capable of using these teeth to do lumberjacking to build dams that are almost a half a mile long. Those teeth are formidable. You can see that they have an orange, sort of iron reinforced dentin in the front and a softer dentin in the back that gives them this chisel shape that allows them to make a very smooth cut. As you can see, they've been gnawing here. They're eating the cambium part, the bark part of the tree. When you see them fell a tree, they're just interested in getting the tree down to a place where they can gnaw the bark or they're used to the tree to make a dam. Now, the other thing that makes them particularly interesting, and I salute Mike Arnott for sending me, sending me this picture. Uh, this is a, a picture of what beavers can do in the middle of wildfire season. Uh, this is what's called the Emerald Refuge. These are from uh, National Geographic, these photos, that show an Idaho wildfire that totally cleared out a valley, except for the water 
uh, ways and the water meadows created by the beavers. Now they do this by building their dams, of course, and these front paws are very, very agile. They use them like hands and they'll eat, they'll roll these leaves, they'll roll lily pads and eat them like burritos. They're, they're total vegetarians. They do not eat, they're not omnivores at all. They don't eat meat. And they're large. These are very large rodents. Uh, this back foot that you see here that the beaver paddles with is over seven inches long. And this whole rodent himself weighs 40 to 60 pounds. We're talking golden retriever size animal. But beavers will spend a lot of time grooming their fur to keep it waterproof. They have an oil gland down by their uh, anus, and that's what they spread all over their fur to keep it in good shape. They have a tail that is a, like a Swiss army knife. Now, this beaver was crawling over a, 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 a wall uh, when Dale Manette took this photo. And this tail is a fat reserve that they can live the, off the fat of the land in the winter. It's a way to keep their temperature control. It's a lot of flat area. It helps them swim. It's a very strong rudder when it swims. And it's their danger signal. On the left, on the right hand side, you'll see the paddle tail being whipped up and about to be slapped down, which makes an echoing crack like a rifle shot and tells everything to get out of the way. Now, beaver aren't all work and no play. Here's one that is spooking mergansers. Mary Holland of the Naturally Curious blog ha had this in her blog, and I thought it was charming. Here's the beaver's head, and he's just swimming around after these hooded mergansers until they turn around and confront him, and then he swims off. But he did it with mallards, too. Now, the one problem is that if beavers aren't careful, their ponds can get too deep. And if they get too deep, remember those lily, lily pads that need to be in five feet or less water? They kill their lily pads and they love to eat lily pads. So they, they sometimes can be their own worst enemies. There is a problem though for beavers and that's drought. This is Kendrick Pond, that same pond I showed you earlier, right now. We're in a severe drought. That pond, that beaver lodge is totally landlocked now and is empty. The beavers can't really use it as a hideaway. Most of the time when you see a beaver in the water, all you're going to see is its head. And this is what makes people think that muskrats are beaver. Muskrats are not beaver. Muskrats are about the size of a football. They're only three or four pounds to the 40 to 60 pounds of a beaver. And the muskrat, as you can see here, has a rat-like tail. It's actually a triangular shape, and it looks like a snake swimming behind it in the water. Here's a water feature that my neighbor, my, one of my friends had. This pond is about three feet in diameter. You can see the size of the muskrat and the long snake-like tail. And she's calling me and saying, Barbara, there's a beaver in my pond. And I'm trying to imagine the 60-pound beaver in her little three-foot pond. And I'm thinking, no, no, this has got to be a muskrat. And it was, of course. But to give you, again, a sense of the size, this is the life-size muskrat at the Museum of Science in, uh, here in Boston. And this is my hand. It's a very small animal. Now, most people think they're seeing a muskrat, uh, think they're seeing a beaver, because you can see the beaver's head here. The beaver's head is the size of the entire muskrat. So the muskrat, when it's swimming, is gonna, the whole body is going to be visible in the water whereas the beaver, it's not. So I've managed to contail myself into, <laughs> to only an hour. Let's take our Q&A then. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much, Barbara. It was a wonderful presentation and you help keep summer alive for another week for us. Thank you very much. I have some questions for Barbara that have been submitted. I'm gonna go back to when we first approached the pond and it's quiet and we're not focusing yet on specifics that are in it. And Dan sent a question in that said, when I sit by local ponds before dusk, I see many ripples on the water. I have always wondered what creates them. Fish that eat bugs on the surface? Well, you know, this is an interesting issue. So let me bring up that slide of the 
pond in the evening and, and in the morning. So the little tiny ripples that you'll see can be any number of things. They can definitely be insects and fish coming up to get them. They can also be, if the ripples have a direction, they can be small minnows fleeing uh, snapping turtles and other turtles in, that are swimming in the water because painted turtles will eat small fish. In fact, the people at uh, Zoo New England that are doing the turtle uh, project at the uh, Arnold Arboretum use sardines to bait their traps. <laughs> Turns out painted turtles love sardines. So those, they could be burps of methane from the bottom of a very shallow pond, uh, just bubbling up to the surface. Or it could be things that are falling onto the lake uh, from the air. At this point in time, uh, this evening point of time, what you're going to see mostly is uh, a bunch of animals swimming, you know, not swimming, flying, bats and, and birds flying and capturing insects in the air. So I think those tiny ripples are probably fish coming up for insects, or if it's a, if it's a small pond and it's um, really poor in oxygen, the fish may be coming to the surface to get air. Terrific, thank you, lots of possibilities. Uh, Alan Nogi has a question. Ever worried about invasives and the health of our open spaces? He's interested in how cattails hold up versus Phragmites, the invasive Phragmites. And he wants to know if the cattails are able to hold their own and compete. And I guess he's thinking, is that a way to, if we had more cattails, would that be a way to decrease the level of Phragmites? I, the, the honest answer is I don't know how cattails compete versus Phragmites. I know where cattails are established, it's hard for anything else to get established. Uh, but I honestly don't know whether one can outcompete the other. In an area that is open where there are no cattails, whoever gets there first is what I would guess, but I don't honestly know. It's a good, good topic for research. I have a cattail question. Why are there so darn many seeds in cattails? Uh, do they have an unusually low survival rate? What, what causes there to be so many in each one? Again, I, I wish I could tell you the answer. I don't know. Okay, that has me very curious. Uh, now we're gonna start moving on to, to the animate life. Uh, how do you distinguish the frog and the toad tadpoles? Is there a way when you're looking at a mass of them to know which is which? There is, but you have to get really close. So if you're looking at a, say, a vernal pool that would have uh, wood frog tadpoles and, uh, and, and toad tadpoles, your wood frog tadpoles are actually going to be smaller than your toad tadpoles. Your toad tadpoles are going to be black, and your wood frog tadpoles are going to have uh, like a a speckled gold on them, and uh, they'd be sort of brown with a speckled gold on the top. Your bullfrog tadpoles, of course, are going to be huge. You will, there is no, and, and so are green frog tadpoles. They're just ginormous. Uh, they're cream colored on the bottom and sort of spotted on the top. Uh, both of those frogs do take multiple years to mature. So when people see us turning over the tadpoles to see what color their bellies are, we'll, we'll send them. I would go by size. Yeah. <laughs> Bullfrog tadpoles also uh, have a habit of basking. So if you have like a rock that's close to the surface, you'll see these big tadpoles sort of hooked onto the rock, just sitting there, scraping the rock for algae, but also basking. How neat. Uh, we're going to move up a little bit in the animal kingdom here. Why do snappers lay more, more eggs? Do we know why? They're larger. They can. <laughs> Good answer. It's, uh, it, it is a much larger animal. And um, as I say, they have to be really old and large before they do start to lay eggs. So your snapper is going to be at least 8 to 10 inches in diameter before it even begins to... Uh, to lay eggs. And your largest painted turtle is only going to be six inches in length. And wow. she 
and accommodate the same and and you remember how small the plastron was on the snapping turtle mm -hmm. more area to expand okay now we have a question from mike who who sent you the National Geographic photo. He says, I know state and local authorities in Massachusetts are ready and able to step in and remove beavers when they are perceived as threats to private property, roads, or other infrastructure. But are there any state or local government efforts to work with beavers to protect and improve watersheds? Not that I know of in Massachusetts. In the southwestern states and in the northwestern states, there are um, state, local, and uh, uh, nature conservancy efforts, partnerships to bring beaver back to the land so that you can raise the water table because they do raise the water table by having these big ponds uh, so that stock can graze all year round and have water available to them, but also in the Northwest so that fisheries can have uh, places for the fish fry to grow. You know, John Regison from the state is one of our advisors. That would be a good question for us to ask him the next time we're talking to him. That would be a great idea. I see that Jane Lewis has raised her hand. Oh, you're good I to see her hand. She has a question that she could type into the uh, Q&A or whether she just wanted to raise her hand. <laughs> okay, well, we will keep our eye out for it to appear. Uh, Paul is asking, what did you say is happening at Houghton Pond? Uh, Houghton Pond is going through some rehabilitation. Uh, it's called hydro raking. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, you remember how that pond was sort of a long, narrow, snaky looking thing? It almost looks like a stream. It's very, very shallow. And it's become so clogged with aquatic now that they have to rake some of it out to keep it as a pond. Ponds, uh, ponds are temporary. They don't last a long time uh, unless you take care of them. Uh, most of the time it's on a geologic time scale, you know, hundreds of years. But in the case of Houghton, it's people time <laughs> and it's just getting filled in so it needs to be cleaned out again. And also if you go to the Arnold Arboretum, you'll see they dredge ponds. Uh, and even in the Newton Cemetery, they're, they're dredging silt out of a pond just to keep the depth uh, deep enough to keep it as a pond. It's hard, Hammond Pond is having a tough time too. Are there any other questions to come in? Alan wants you to know how much more there is to see and appreciate in the ponds, which is absolutely true. And this was- <laughs> you, you would never have enough time to go through everything in that pond. Well, Thank you for not more coming in here. Thank you for giving us such an amazing view of it. If anyone has more questions or if while you're going to sleep tonight, you think, oh, I should have asked. Uh, you can get questions to Barbara at info at newtonconservators.org. And I'm sure she'll be happy to get back to you. Thank you so much. It, this was just absolutely amazing. And we really appreciate you all being here. And Bye-bye, everyone.